Good morning, everybody, or should I say good afternoon and very welcome. On behalf of the Fulch Ireland team, I'd like to express a very warm welcome to you today for so many participants taking the time with us to be with here this morning and to thank you as well for your contributions to the webinar and submitting advanced questions for us today. It's really helped us guide the specific information we'll try to focus on in the time we have. We very much appreciate the time you're taking to be with us in such pressurised circumstances in your business um, and in such unprecedented circumstances for Ireland and for Irish tourism. I'd like to begin by first confirming that we've set aside about 45 minutes for the broadcast today. We'll be making the recording available to share with your wider colleagues when we add it to our COVID-19 business supports hub under our HR risk area within the next 24 hours. So you can look out for it there following the event. I should also note that uh, we're attempting to host this webinar remotely uh, with the support of my colleagues while recognising broadband pressure has been brought to bear right across the country as all of us try to adapt to remote working. Uh, and while school and college students, of course, are dipping in and out of live streaming as well for their uh, entertainment, but also for college lectures. So if we stall at any point this morning um, or lose, if you lose visual or audio momentarily, just please bear with us. So to begin, I'd like to welcome back our subject matter expert, Caroline McHenry, to our live broadcast today. Good morning, Caroline, you're very welcome. Thank you so much, Manda, delighted to be here. Thank you. Caroline, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, is a HR and employment law expert, uh, having set up the HR suite in 2009. And she's also a former member of the Low Pay Commission, as well as acting as an adjudicator in the Workplace Relations Commission. And for those of you who have not yet had the time to watch her excellent series around managing HR risk during COVID-19, which she prepared with us around St. Patrick's Day, these uh, web webinars are still available on the Fulch Ireland site, so please make sure you and your colleagues refer back to them over the coming days alongside the broadcast. So for the purpose of the subject matter today, which is managing HR employment payments during COVID-19, we've asked Caroline to briefly recap on where the current status is in terms of policies and procedures, considering ongoing advice from HSE and government directives, and in accordance with good practice, of course. She'll also then walk us through the various COVID 19 HR employment and other support payment options available to businesses and discuss the HR planning considerations required for employers in considering and reviewing each. Uh, and we expect that that will provide a lot of clarity to some of the qu many questions you've submitted to us in advance. And finally, then we'll move to a live Q&A uh, session to address as many of your other questions as time allows. And should we run out of time with regard to that, we'll make the other answers available in a subsequent FAQ, which will accompany uh, this webinar. So also joining me today in the background is my colleague, Helen McDade, who will be fielding me your live questions. So. Uh, if you wish, you can welcome in the course of the webinar to use your question function on the right hand side of your screen to post your questions to us by text chat. Also a shout out to Colette Cleary uh, and Ian Cleary managing our technology here today and keeping us all connected. So no pressure, Colette and Ian. Um, so C Caroline, enough from me, over to you um, before we pick up with audience questions. Great, thanks, Amanda. So good morning, everybody, or good afternoon now. Um, I suppose the purpose of um, this morning's webinar, as Amanda announced, was to give you a very good update on the most topical and the most pressing issues around COVID-19 for people in your industry at the moment. So just to maybe do a little bit of a recap to start with, um, then we're going to talk to you about the illness and absence process because there are still employees working remotely or there are still employees working in uh, vital services. Um, we're also going to talk to you about the policies and practices for COVID-19. And then we're going to talk about the changes in working hours that a lot of you have had to implement whether that's short time layoff or redundancy. And then we're going to talk to you about the payment options and supports that are available. And we're going to give you some top tips around managing remote workers because it's a new type of remote working that we're not used to. And then we're going to take the Q&A. So to start with, I'm going to do a brief recap. Um, so the key points, I suppose, in relation to what we've covered already. And as Amanda mentioned, there are some videos available if you'd like to go back and revisit them. The first um, reminder is 
you all have a COVID-19 policy in place at this stage and it's important to continue to update your COVID-19 policy um, to make sure that you are operating um, with an up-to-date policy. Remember your policy is what's going to be referred to if there is an issue or a, a, a debate at a later stage in relation to ambiguity. So remember the Marks and Spencer's case where um, in Cork during Storm Emma 11 employees were out sick and they basically said sorry we couldn't travel to work because we were unable to attend and it came back to saying what did your policy say and what was the universal approach you took um, to that situation so your policy is crucially important so also i want to remind you in relation to social distancing we've had some clients in the industry getting very bad publicity about posting pictures of groups of staff who might be working in vital services now to help maintain the business, yet the group picture means they're not maintaining social distancing. So just be very careful that if you are a vital service, which is only operating now at this stage, um, ensure that social distancing is maintained. For businesses that are also in that category, generally now for business continuity purposes, they've got a team A and a team B, which don't overlap which means that even if somebody in team A was to be out sick, you still have a team B who can keep the show on the road in case there was issues with close contacts. So again, it's good to revisit that. We um, spoke about the hygiene practices, which now need to be increased further in any way you can, um, subsequent to the vital uh, notice uh, from Friday. We're going to talk more about remote working because for a lot of organizations, they still have some key roles operating as remote workers. And we'll talk more about that towards the end. Um, your absence policy and what you've decided to do in relation to your sick pay scheme. Because remember, if you have employees who are still working and they get sick, they can apply for um, the illness benefit but you need to understand what's the absence policy you have in place, who do they notify, how does that operate, and are you going to top it up? So again, your policy in relation to that is very important. The other area to emphasize also in that regard is to remember that GDPR rules, particularly to do with medical data, still apply. So if you have an employee who rings in, make sure that there's only a limited designated amount of people that they should be ringing into to let them know that they have symptoms or that they feel unwell or indeed that they've been in a confirmed case. Because again, we've had a number of breaches where they've rang in and somebody has communicated that to the wider uh, workplace and it has caused very serious issues for the company. So again, just to be aware of that. So Caroline can I just check on that? Is it still the case that the HSC are managing the communication to contacts? It's not the employer's place to do that. So if somebody within the house is um, designated as potentially uh, a suspected case and they're waiting for testing, testing is taking a number of days and it's taking a number of days for the results to come back. So again, I would say that the people need to get follow the GP's advice. And it has been the case that some of the GP advice has been actually, if there's people living in the house with you, they should self-isolate or quarantine. To be entitled to the payment, they need to be medically certified though. That's the difference. So again, follow the advice. It's a very good point, uh, Colette, in that regard, um, or Amanda. So the next point is vulnerable people. So if you've pregnant employees or anybody with an underlying health condition, because now we're in vital worker stage, really they shouldn't be at work. And you need to also consider people who are over the age of 65. Remember anyone over 70 is cocooning at the moment, but you need to put those into that category just to make sure that they're happy to be at work and that they've no health conditions that might cause them a concern. Or alternatively, if you have a staff member who is a vulnerable person at home, because we're in a new phase now, as you do your recent risk assessment this week, you need to consider those kind of, of areas. And if you have anybody who might feel ill in the workplace, you're immediately sending them home and don't take any chances. The last point is we have a number of people also who are the worried well, who are at work or who are operating but they're just worried because they feel they could become unwell for whatever reason. It's it's becoming more and more of an issue. People are staff are getting more and more nervous, which you can understand. So again, I would 
encourage a lot of engagement and consultation with them um, and to decide what's best to do. But I'd be reluctant to force anybody to be at work in the current situation that we're in now. So if I move on to the next slide then, um, and I maybe go through the staffing options available for employers. So we have three options that are available to employers and short time is the first option to consider. And a lot of you would have initially considered short time or you may have a limited number of staff, particularly in your management team, currently operating on short time or those that might be working in team A and team B. So short time occurs if you don't have full-time staff work, if you don't have enough work available for full-time staff. So if you, for example, have, need to reduce the hour, their hours to more than half or less than three days. So if that's necessary to do, the person goes on short time. The idea of short time is it's for a short term period. So you don't want, you want to make sure the employee knows that that will be reviewed on a bi-weekly basis to ensure that it's meeting your business requirements. Some organizations are doing it on a weekly basis. You can decide. It's most commonly used to facilitate more social distancing. So where you have people who are working a vital service that need to come in or in organizations where there's limited work available, but you still need the function to be uh, operating. So for example, you might have a staff member who's working on the marketing and branding guidelines that have been uh, recommended by Fall to Ireland, but it's enough for them to be doing that on a two and a half day a week, for example, and as a result, they're on short time, but you need somebody working on it for some number of hours. So that's the first option. The next option is to consider layoff and layoff is pausing the contract of employment. And it's important to remember that if you pause the contract of employment, the employee doesn't accrue holidays during that period of time, but they do accrue public holidays for the first 13 weeks. So when the contract is paused, you're basically saying you've no work at the moment, but again, because it's short term, you basically are saying we'll review it on a bi-weekly basis. The reason you're doing that as well is you want to keep communication up with your employees because after all this is over, we want our employees to feel that we looked after them as best we could in very difficult times. And the more communication you do, the better. So again, my advice would be to over communicate. And by you saying we'll review it every two weeks, it encourages you to have an update ready for your employees on that basis. So layoff is what most employers who have now closed have done for their general body of staff at this stage. And the third option available, which we're hoping is an absolute last resort, is for employers who have decided that, for example, they might be closing the business and are not tending to, intending to reopen. So if those employers are in that situation, it is the position, not the person that's been made redundant, which is clearly important to outline. And also the legislation has been updated only last week with the new legislation to say that the uh, layoff has been paused. So at the previously an employee who was on layoff for more than four weeks could apply to their employer for redundancy and they would be entitled to that if the employer didn't put in a counterclaim within seven days to say in the next four weeks I will have a block of 13 weeks work for you. So now Pascal uh, Donahue confirmed last week that that has been paused until the 21st of May and it will be reviewed again then. So that's very welcome news for employers who already had employees who were indicating and signaling that they might be interested in that. Um, redundancy. So Caroline, um, just to confirm, sorry, to confirm on the redundancy then, the option is still there for the employer right now if circumstances are really that difficult that they actually cannot foresee themselves reopening. The employer option is still there, but the employee option is paused. So the employer okay. can't book redundancy, the employee can't. Great. And obviously the employer needs to be very careful in the selection of employees for redundancy that that paper trail confirms the posts and the roles that have been made redundant rather than it being seen 
to discriminate or be cherry picking in terms of who ends up been made redundant. Is that right? Yeah, so for all these three options, Amanda, it's important that you document and keep a record of <clears throat> the process that you've followed. So you'll identify, I'll take a drink of water, apologies. No problem. So you're going to identify how you selected people for redundancy, mm -hmm. how you selected them for layoff or for short time. If you're treating all your staff the same, it's easier to show how you use that selection criteria. So in other words, if for redundancy, your business is closed, which would be terrible, and we're hoping that won't happen for people. But if that's the case and all staff are being made redundant, it justifies the selection criteria better. Because with all of these, it's all about the position and business requirements mm -hmm. and not about the person, as you've rightly said. So I would recommend for the entire process that you're documenting all your communication and all your selection criteria right throughout the process. Great, thanks, Caroline. So if we move on then to the next area, we're going to talk to you about the different payment options that are available and the different types of support that are available. So the first option to talk to you about is the short-term work support. And the short-term work support is for employees who have been put on short time, which we spoke about already, which basically means their hours are reduced to more than less than three days or their wages are reduced by more than half. So this um, option is available to employees to process. It basically is a job seeker's benefit. They need to meet the criteria accordingly in that regard. And you as an employer will give them a letter and notification that they're going to be on short time and then they apply for that themselves. And that process basically is as if they're following the job seekers benefit because it is a job seekers payment. The COVID-19 pandemic payment is designed to facilitate people who are laid off to um, get a payment during this period of time. So to get the pandemic unemployment payment, the employee must be laid off by their employer to say they have no work available for them at the moment. The second criteria is that they must um, be available for work and they must not be unwell. And basically the employee applies for it or the employer can pay it to them and it can be topped up by the employer also. There is an anomaly associated with this where no matter what wage you had previously, the um, employee gets 350 euro. However, the government and revenue have said that they're going to remedy this at the end of the year by looking at people's tax credits, but hopefully there will be more communication emphasizing that because a lot of employees are saying, well, actually, I rather than working, I prefer to be put on the pandemic payment or obviously the challenge of bringing them back to work. If you have work from that scheme will present an issue also, but it is an anomaly um, that is to be addressed at the end of the year is what the advice has been in that regard. So, okay. the so that would suggest, Caroline, then if you've got part-time staff, for example, not normally when they're working in receipt of 350 euros, but financially at the moment, it looks like they're better off to be on the unemployment benefit, but this is due to be reviewed with tax credits at the end, before the end of the year. That's it. And look, that's what they're saying they're going to do. So um, that's what we expect uh, will happen. So the next option then is the wage subsidy scheme, which has caused so much confusion and a lot of challenges for people in terms of deciding you know are they uh, an eligible employer uh, for the scheme and there's been lots of guidance coming from revenue i suppose because this is a scheme that is embedded in law it is the legislation that guides us and any guidance that comes is helpful in that regard because it gives us the spirit and the intent of the scheme. But the legislation is always where we get our core guidance as with any other advice we give. So this wage subsidy scheme is available to all sectors. To qualify, employers must be able to show that COVID-19 has uh, provided economic disruption, which I would presume every business in the country can meet that criteria. However, uh, except maybe the businesses that are booming, you know, that are particularly busy at the moment as a result, 
but you then need to be also able to show there, there's a minimum of 25% of a decline in turnover or in customer orders, um, or if you're a new startup in relation to investors, et cetera. So you need to be able to show that you're financially um, impacted uh, very significantly at a minimum of 25% decline in turnover. It also requires that you can't pay uh, wages or outgoings and you are required to retain employees on the payroll, which means that if you put the employees on the subsidy scheme, which is um, designed to last for 12 weeks and they'll review it at the end of that, you can't lay people off during the period while they're on the wage subsidy scheme. And also, um, they've given us a reference period to say employees can't be increased in terms of the money that they um, earn. And they've also given us a reference period when we're working out the average wage, which to use January and February to get the average. Now, obviously, that's not ideal because for a lot of uh, Fault Ireland uh, businesses, they would maybe have been the quieter times but the guidelines are very specific in relation to how to do the processing. So, and they also need to be on your payroll as of the 29th of February um, and have gone through um, the payroll system. So again, they don't want any new employees being added um, and they're very strict in that regard. And the employee may have come from the COVID-19 pandemic unemployment payment because the business now may be deciding, look, we're going, we've made a decision that we're el eligible. If you do that, I would recommend that you, uh, first of all, do a director's meeting and keep very detailed minutes of the meeting to show how you came to the decision that you were eligible for the wage subsidy scheme. So using all the information available, including any advice you got from any third parties to show this is the responsible you know, uh, way we addressed whether we were eligible or not and minute and record that. Um, then I would say your next step is to communicate with staff to let them know because you're now availing of the wage subsidy scheme that they need to uh, come off the other scheme, any other schemes that they're on to avoid there being uh, duplicate payments. Now, revenue and social welfare are communicating, um, but at the same time, it's pragmatic because we, we definitely are going to have people who will get double payments because of the volume of people that are being processed. Um, so that's the other scheme and we'll touch on that but, i'm sure but, with more questions on, on that yeah on that caroline you're suggesting though the onus is actually as it's worded into the scheme um details uh, the onus is actually on the employee but you're better to have the paper trail to confirm you're telling the employee to come off the scheme. The second question I wanted to just confirm with you, did you just say there that if you move people onto the wage subsidy scheme, you can't move them back onto the pandemic scheme during this 12 week period, is that right? No, so what I said was, if you have an employee on the wage subsidy scheme, you can't lay them off during this period. The requirement is that you have to retain the employees on the payroll because if you lay an employee off, you pause their contract of employment so they're no longer on the payroll system. So if somebody is on the wage subsidy scheme, you're committing you're going to keep them on this scheme for the next 12 weeks, unless obviously you have work potentially in the interim because that means you're still retaining them on the payroll system. So the only two okay. that don't maintain them is layoff or redundancy and caroline just a clarification note there then uh, because it's come through on some questions for employers and employees there's some concern around staff temporary laid off will their stamps continue or their work tenure be broken so if an employee is on any of the options that we spoke about the only layoff basically pauses your contract of employment. So it's paused for that period of time. But for all the other options, whether it's any of the other ones we spoke about, then basically your employment continues because the wage subsidy scheme is subsidizing the wages of the employee. So holidays, et cetera, crew. But remember, we mentioned for the layoff, the employees, holidays, pause, they just get their public holidays for the first 13 weeks. Okay, that's great, thank you.
Thank you, Amanda. So the last payment option then is the illness benefit payment. So that basically is for employees who are certified. And that's very important because a lot of employees who have felt they want to self-isolate, they feel they could get that scheme. But it's very clearly saying that without, you need it to have a doctor's cert with it. Again, we let the employee um, apply for the benefit themselves. And then we can, after they've applied, we can decide, are we going to top it up? Are we going to pay it? Will they pay back the company, etc. And the reason you let the employee apply is that they um, have to organise for their GP to submit their uh, medical cert. Um, all of it is done remotely. Um, the benefit is three hundred and fifty euro. It's two weeks for somebody who is medically required to self isolate, and it is up to ten weeks or less, depending on how long they're medically certified for somebody who's diagnosed with the COVID-19 um, benefit. So they are the four payments um, that are in place at the moment to support people during this, this time. Great, thank you. So if we move on then to remote working and then we'll, we'll get to Q&A. Um, so for remote working considerations, we're very conscious that an awful lot of people, particularly since the, announced, the most recent announcement where people have been asked to work from home unless they're a vital service, and that remote working is now very common uh, throughout every industry. So if you are have an employee or you yourself are working from home, obviously we need to have kind of the appropriate best steps to get the most out of it. So for your employees or your management team, um, do a kind of an assessment with them to say, look, have you a suitable place? Have you got a desk? What's your IT like, et cetera, to identify how feasible it is. And most organizations have that set up at this stage. It's really important to you look at your remote working policy, which again, gives people guidelines on you know, what do we consider the requirement when you are remote working in terms of you being available and you being, uh, you know, doing work, um, making sure that people understand they need to confirm they've got an appropriate desk and chair, etc. So again, you're just making it clear to people because remote working, if they're doing it, means they're working as normal, except there's nothing normal about this remote working because normal yes. working from home or remote working would mean that not the whole office is working remotely and also you wouldn't have children or teenagers etc to be available with as well so some people are doing remote working with shared accommodation or all these other avenues that we need to make as practical as possible other tips for managers are to do lots of virtual communication so at least once a day you should do a visual check-in with your team uh, Zoom is brilliant because it'll, it's an easy way to facilitate people to do a virtual daily huddle, which means that the full team can be online. And make sure you set up an online diary where you have a plan for the day in relation to what is it that you're working on and agree realistic goals and realistic availability for people if they're trying to balance working from home with child responsibilities. Make sure people know that you're still available and if they have any queries, they're going to be uh, available to check in with you. Remember data protection because that's a big concern. And my top tips for managers are set a realistic expectation with your um, employees in relation to what you expect from them during this time. I would say make sure you do a virtual check in with them and you do a review of the goals you've set and what's been achieved each week. And top tips for employees are make sure you uh, engage with um, your manager to set realistic goals for employees. Take your breaks regularly as you would if you were at work, because if you're not taking your breaks, your productivity is going to be less and be aware of time management tips around time expands to fill the time available, which is the Pareto principle. So if you don't set 90 minutes or an hour slot to say, I'm going to achieve this now, then it's not going to be as productive. So I think if you're doing remote working, you should reconsider how it's working to, to maximize its benefit for everybody. Excellent, thanks, Caroline. So just to conclude before we go to Q&A, my key top tips for everybody would be to keep up to date on any new legislation or guidelines, etc., via the COVID-19 business supports page on faultireland.ie or on gov.ie. 
maintain communication with your employees remember our retention of these people when we open up is going to be a big test in terms of how well we looked after them communicated with them and engaged with them and kept them connected to our work environment during this time and ensure you have detailed policies in place to adhere to and to give you guidance so that you're setting the right precedent and the right approach and you're treating employees consistently and you're communicating any changes around that that you have. So Amanda, I'll hand it back to you to see if you have any questions uh, from the, the people who are listening. That's great, Caroline. Thank you so much for that. And yes, we do have um, a few, I suppose, just very quickly to kick things off, Caroline. In relation to wage, in regard to wage subsidy um, or indeed short term payment, can a business choose to top up these payments with holiday pay and parental leave? And an important one there, does this require the consent of the employee, which I assume it does? But over to you on that. So we'll do each separately. So if you want an employee, for example, to take holidays and they don't want to, then you need to give them 30 days notice of your requirement for them to take holidays. So for example, if you have an employee now, you can say, look, within now and the next two months, I, I need you to bring your holiday balance up to date and you can give them 30 days notice of that requirement. Or indeed, if you want them to take any holidays they've accrued before their return, that's another option. However, if somebody is on short time, so for example, they're on a two and a half day week, and they want to take one day of that as holidays, that's perfectly fine. Or you can request them to take one day as holidays, but they will only get the benefit based on the number of days they're not working. And holidays are considered to be working the same. So I wouldn't be topping up the short time. And in relation to layoff, the contract is paused. So again, I wouldn't be, I would tell people your holidays are also paused during this time and any holidays you've accrued, you'll be able to either take at the um, end of the layoff period before you return, if that's your option that you choose as an employer or that they will be added to their holiday balance to take later in the year. Okay, um, another question here, Caroline, do staff have the option to refuse to return to payroll if you've worked for them? Uh, and what are the consequences of them not agreeing to return for the period of the scheme? I mean, maybe they feel under pressure with not having childcare arrangements or whatever. What's your view on this? So the layoff payment, the COVID-19 emergency payment, which is the one that most people who are on layoff were on, now they've moved a lot of people to the wage subsidy scheme. Um, if somebody's on layoff, that means you, you have no work available for them. So if you then have work available, that's why it's good to keep the communication up to date every two weeks. But if you have work for them, then they're obliged to be available for work. It's one of the requirements of getting that payment. And in relation to the wage subsidy scheme, that's they are being paid. So if you have work for them, you can give them work to do during this time. And some employers are. Uh, like it's a brilliant opportunity to use it for upskilling staff. I know Fault Ireland have lots of online courses available. So again, you could request staff to do mandatory training during this time uh, if they're on the wage subsidy because they're on the payroll. So again, that's a, a really sensible approach but they are available for work and they are required to be at work. The same as when we're putting people out, I would engage with people to identify why they're reluctant to return. Um, and if it is a case that they're a vulnerable uh, category of worker, for example, they might be pregnant, etc., you will work with them in that regard to maybe assess if it's more appropriate for them to go on to the illness benefit then, because layoff is only applicable when you have no work available. So it isn't appropriate to leave somebody on the layoff payment if it is a case that there actually is work available. Um, so you, you might need to reassess that as the process goes on. Okay, Caroline. And I suppose a question here that came in related to that. If somebody who's, you know, fit and healthy over 65 and they want to return to work, are you, you know, within, uh, you know, safety guidelines to offer them back at work, assuming if you have the right safety procedures in place? So 
over 65, under 70, you can. Again, once you've done the consultation with the worker and the worker is saying they're medically happy to be at work and they've no underlying conditions, etc., and you can pro you can provide a safe place of work for them, they can continue to work. Um, particularly if they're working remotely, it poses no issue. It's more for the vital workers that are working because we know there's a lot of people in the industry who are providing um, takeaway food, for example, still at the moment, or they might be providing food for the for the emergency services, etc. It's the concern more in relation to the social distancing if people are physically still required to be at work. And there's a big PR piece associated with that as well. And I'm sure your branding guidelines from Fault Ireland have a lot of information in that regard but the last thing we want is to be seen to be not doing social distancing or not looking after our people as best we can at this time when people are so sensitive to it particularly now that we're in the vital stage that we're in. Great Caroline thank you um, and just another question here live there from uh, Colin is the wage supplement for is there any wage supplement uh, for employees who are under the age of 18? Unfortunately not um, the under 18s um, don't have any um, entitlement um, because this is deemed to be um, in line with the job seekers parallel type of criteria so um, those employees um, unfortunately not. Okay and another one here from Sarah, can a person who's on sick leave avail of layoff government scheme instead of sick pay? So no is the answer, if somebody is sick then they suit the COVID-19 uh, sick leave an employee who it needs to be available for work if they're on um, the layoff. So what you don't want is somebody to be on the layoff. You might need to bring them back to work and they say they're sick and they're unavailable for work. Well, then they're not suited to the layoff. However, I think we'll have to be practical if they're in the middle of a period of time and they get sick, we're not going to take them off the scheme, for example, and put them on another one. But in deciding when you are putting somebody on and when you're taking somebody off, you've more control at that stage and it's more feasible to make an assessment. Whereas when they're on it for a period of 12 weeks, for example, you're not going to be making changes in the middle of that, I would say. Right, okay. Um, if we have a case where our staff has been put uh, temporarily, sorry, has been put on temporary layoff, when we reopen, can we put them on reduced hours until the business picks up again? Uh, we've had a lot of cancelled business for the summer. Obviously, people will need to reevaluate, you know, the business that's going to come to them in the next period. Uh, would you offer advice there, Caroline, please? So if you, when you're starting to reopen, you will use the same selection criteria. And again, I would be documenting this um, to show how you have decided who is most necessary to come back at what stage. And if you have work available, people are obliged to come back and do it. Um, and again, you can look and say, look, I can't bring you back on full time, but I actually have three days work available, for example, so they can go on the short time uh, work support and be working with you for those three days. So again, you have options available to you. And I think that there'll be a lot of planning going into that returning phase because some employees within the sector have left and have gone and taken up other employment in the busy sectors like the supermarket sector and the pharmacy sector. Um, other uh, people will be delighted to come back. So I think it's there's a couple of maybe areas that we need to look at closer to the time when we're looking at that assessment. But the crucial thing is you can't be seen to have selected somebody based on grounds you can't objectively justify in line with your business requirements. And just to say, I suppose, there are a huge amount of claims going into the WRC associated with incorrect processing of somebody going on layoff, unfair selection processes, etc. And we're hearing lots of feedback back from clients in that regard. So I would say just make sure that you you remember the importance of following the correct process making sure you have a good paper trail, making sure that you document your decisions uh, right along the way, no matter what that decision is. And again, you're doing that as objectively justified as you can, because that's the requirement in law for that process. 
Okay, thanks, Caroline. Another one then, uh, just before we finish up, a few of our employees signed up to the COVID pandemic unemployment scheme, but now I'm putting a few of them on the revenue a wage subsidy scheme. How do we switch them over and inform Department of Social Protection? So that's a point we covered already, which was we need to notify the employees that they should uh, notify them also and there is communication happening between the different departments. So again, um, once they go on one, they stop the other. We are concerned that there might be some overlap, but once we do as much of the communication as we can, the better. And I would say, if you can communicate with your local office, as well as using the national, I think that's helpful because those local connections will make a difference, in, especially if you're processing large numbers of staff um, and they are, we're finding nationally that they are being very helpful from a local perspective, uh, even though they're, they're so under pressure, they're doing an amazing job in that regard. Okay, and I suppose just to point people as well, there is an opportunity to submit your specific queries in relation to procedures around this online with revenue.ie directly, uh, and there's good guidance there on their documentation. And we've copies of that, of course, on the Falsha Ireland website under the COVID-19 Business Hub um, supports, under government supports for that. Uh, so very last thing then, Caroline, can I just say that, um, can an employer operate a scheme two and three as listed? So can you, you don't have to have everybody on the one scheme. You can have a mix of employees on both. Is that yeah, what we're no, saying? There. There's no guidelines that say we can't. Um, I suppose I would say that's a doable option if you have smaller numbers of people. I think if you have a very large number of staff as a business, you're going to be making a decision to see which scheme is most practical for you to operate um, but there's no prohibiting factors saying you can't um, but I would say um, you know just make sure that you do do your assessment and you do do your notification process as well. Great and very last one Caroline um, an example here where um, uh, there was somebody, I suppose people are kind of concerned about the fact that for seasonal employees, they wouldn't necessarily have been on their books um, in the period of January, February, and they were due to start work. Are we saying at the moment that the schemes cannot support those workers that would have been due to start seasonally around St. Patrick's Day? So those employees will have to go via the job seekers benefit. Um, I empathise greatly with them because those yeah. seasonal staff, there's no there's no good news option in terms of one of those options to be applicable to them. Um, so if they're not already on the payroll, um, that basically means no new people can be added. And that's been a, a specific requirement of the scheme. So unfortunately, they have to go through the normal job seekers option themselves. OK, well, look, as Caroline, I'm afraid that's all we've had time for this afternoon. To everybody with us listening, we hope you found it useful uh, and that it's offered you some clarity around the various schemes and considerations for each. Our sincere thanks to Caroline McHenry today for her time against what is a really busy schedule for her and her team at the HR Suite. To Colette and Helen uh, and Ian in the background, thank you so much for your support today. Can I remind you, if we didn't manage to address your questions either through the presentation or our Q&A, we will be preparing a support FAQ guide to the webinar and we'll attempt to address the questions there or you may wish to contact our business supports email address or direct your queries through if they're of a, a technical nature around schemes and eligibility you can direct them through to um, the revenue department or mywelfare.ie. We will of course have the recording as I said of the live broadcast added to our HR risk section of the COVID business supports hub uh, within the next 24 hours so please refer there and prompt your colleagues to also review that. Uh, along with our other business supports on the website, which we're adding to all the time. So we do recommend you check in daily on that. We're also adding details of our available online staff training resources and programs that Caroline referred to uh, for you and your staff and management teams over the coming weeks. So keep an eye out for those. And finally, it just remains me, for me to thank you for your time uh, and to remind you on behalf of ourselves, our CEO, Paul Kelly, our director team, and indeed all our local Falsha Ireland teams 
we are here to support you every step of the way through these really difficult days and weeks ahead. So please continue to reach out to us, continue to contact your local Fudge Island representative and continue to tune into our business supports email to keep you advised uh, and to keep us advised of the emerging supports as you need them. We're here, uh, we'll be with you all the way. And just not last, last but not least to say to you, to your teams, yourselves, your family and friends to stay safe, stay well and remember we're in this together we'll continue to work and be there with you uh, to support tourism recovery